one story in the history of Galway football has a simple title, but a title that tells it all really, the day the crossbar broke. Uh, Harry Cowell asked me to play with, uh, would you play with Dublin? If, if you do, he said, you'll be captain, because we we're after winning the championship. Jeez, Harley says I would have seen none of them. The street leagues were very controversial because they were tough. You had to be a man to survive. Just the country lads that mainly uh, played for Caden Trailer. And I was a country fella, and Caden Trailer were my team. And we used to actually have war when we'd play against Dunmore. Christmas was at the end of that week. And as I said, there was an inch of snow on the ground, and conditions under that were very mucky. Pat Spillane was sent in on Mike Judge that day. And you could have picked better spots on a day like that than in on Mike. I played a 14 championships for Galway. So you would, you would imagine that somewhere along, that, over that stretch of time, that you would be lucky enough to, to, to win, win the big one, you know. And yeah, I do have some regrets about that. And, uh, and the longer it goes on, I think the more regrets you have. I often think I, I love it. He was such a great footballer. I love that we could manage to bring his remains back and bury him in the Hard. I remember when I started first, I didn't even have pair of boots. What we used at that stage was, I used to cut the top of a Wellington, and this is where the fun used to be. The Wellingtons, if you left them too long, they'd be restricting you. So we cut them at the, just above the ankle. As well as winning their ninth All-Ireland Senior Football title in 2001, Galway GA had reached the pinnacle of its illustrious 117-year history. This was the first time since the founding of the GA that the county had contested both the senior hurling and football finals in the same year. The Galway GA tradition goes back further than that historic November meeting in Hayes' Hotel. Eleven weeks earlier, on the 15th of August, 1884, Michael Cusack had outlined his plans for a new organisation to an invited group from County Galway at a small meeting in Loch Ray. Michael Finnegan, a founding member of Dunmore McHale's GA Club in 1887, was invited to the meeting. They went to Dr Duggan and uh, Dr Duggan was very enthusiastic about their nationalist views but he said he was too ill and he advised them to go to Dr. Um, Croak. They uh, went to uh, Torlis and Tipperary to Hayes' house and that was the, uh, where the GA was already founded, officially founded. Dunmore were awarded the first County Galway senior football title in 1889 and won six other titles in the first 24 years. Their near neighbours, Chewham, won 10 titles in that period. 1887 was the year the club was founded and um, uh, Chewham Stars were pretty successful over the first 10 years or so because uh, the records show that they won uh, a number of county championships, uh, 1892 on to 1896. Quite a number of teams are affiliated in the town, the Stars, the Commercials, St. Jarlitz, the Crugers, called after um, uh, the president of Transvaal. The Boer War was on at the time and he evidently, his name was Paul Kruger. So they picked that and I think there was a team in Athen Rhine known as the DeWitts and they also uh, brought that name back from the Boer War. 
Galway reached their first All-Ireland final in 1900. The county was represented by the county champions, Chewham Krugers, and included a few stars from the surrounding clubs. The dominance of Galway football for the first 25 years by North Galway, especially Chewham and Dunmore, switched dramatically to East Galway after 1912. Ballina Slow won the first of a remarkable seven county senior football finals in a row in 1913 and won every senior county final played from 1913 to 1929. In 1910 we uh, contested the first county title with Dunmore and we won it. But like all matches at that particular time, most of them ended up in an objections. Dunmore objected to Ballina Slow. Uh, Bandeslaw won it at the county board level, uh, Dunmore appealed to the Connacht Council and Dunmore won the appeal on the grounds that two of the Bandeslaw players uh, played hockey. Well, Father Broderick and uh, Tom Keating were the people who actually started and organised football in town. Uh, and there is a cup in the position of the club known as the Father Broderick Cup and it's dated back to 1913, 1914. The first winners were in 1914. In 1917, in Mount Bellion, on, on a famous day, on the 2nd of June, we beat the pick of the county by a pint. Football was very strong in the town that time, in that you had six or seven teams. You had to have Brackerna, Jubilee, the town, the square, um, Collier, which is in Pierce's country in Roscommon. You had the Bridget's or the Mental Hospital, as it would be known in that time. Derry Mullen had three teams. The street leagues were very controversial because they were tough. You had to be a man to survive. Ballinasloe backboned the county senior team for their three All-Ireland final appearances in this period. The first was in 1919. On the 1919 team, there was nine to 10 Ballinasloe players on it. Three Egan brothers. There was Tom, who was captain, and Dennis and Johnny. Uh, there was P. Fallon and Peter Higgins. There was the famous Knacker Welsh. There was the Paddy Roach. There was the Gilby Ginnans. You know, those were players, uh, household names in County Galway and they were the backbone of the team that uh, sensationally beat Kerry in a replay, the first team that ever beat Kerry in a replay. And we went on to an All-Ireland final, uh, unfortunately beaten by Kildare in the, what is famously known as the Larry Stanley final, the 1919 final. Galway were back in the All-Ireland final again in 1922 after beating Sligo in a replay. The Balnasloe team was now strengthened by a young 22-year-old wing-back from Dunmore. McDonnell was a great character, uh, you know, he, he was a very lively man, he, he, he was a very fast, skillful footballer. He was a great leader in the field, he was tough, he was hard, he, you know, he, he wanted to win and uh, he was right half back on that Galway team that played the 1922 final in October 1923. Well, Nacker Welch came to town as a young lad. Uh, he was famous as a Galway footballer. His goal against Mio in the 1919 first round of the Connacht Championship is still talked about in football circles as one of the great all-time goals in the Connacht Championship. He scored three goals in the semi-final against Kerry. The earliest film footage of Galway football available is of UCG playing UCC in Terenure, Dublin in January 1924. As in 1922, the 1925 Connacht final was late and Mayo were nominated to represent Connacht in the All-Ireland semi-final. Galway were declared champions in unusual circumstances. You had uh, Kerry and uh, Cavan. Uh, Kerry out of Munster and Cavan out of Ulster. And you had, uh, in, in Leinster you had Wexford. Uh, now there was a bit, of a, a bit of a hitch in Connacht, so they nominated Mayo to play Wexford. And this meant that the All-Ireland finals now were Wexford and uh, Mio and Kerry and uh, Cavan. So Kerry beat Cavan. But then some bright spark in Cavan, because Cavan had been involved in this declaration rule, decided they should object. And they found that uh, some of the Kerry fellas had been d d playing, for, playing in Dublin and all at the same time playing in Kerry. Uh, which I, I would say, that's grand. As long as he's playing football, it's grand. But anyway, that, that's... Uh, Went to, went to the Congress and uh, uh, Kerry counter objected to Cavan, but so the result was that both of, both teams were actually thrown out of the championship, and that left Mayo and uh, Wexford. Now, 
Uh, Mio and Wexford then played and uh, Mio won. So Mio, in a sense, were all Ireland champions, or were they? That was the question, because back here in Connacht, our lads were having their own kind of civil war going on, you see. The, it was a, uh, another year of uh, postponements and objections and everything else in Connacht. Uh, Sligo and Roscommon played, I think it was six times that particular year, and eventually Sligo came out. Galway played Leithon then twice as well. The Connacht Council decided we'd have to play the final of the Connacht Championship, you see, and this was coming on to, to October. Our lads uh, apparently didn't want to play too, too much because uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of clashing with the, with the Great October Fair, which was a big thing in Banlaslaw, a big week of, of drinking and carousing and singing and dancing. The final anyway was fixed for June. It was played in the middle of October and uh, Galway went on and beat, uh, they beat Mio. There was a meeting of the Congress and uh, Mio were uh, congratulating themselves as all Iron champions, but some crafty Galway member of the Congress proposed that Galway be the clear champions. Hadn't they beaten Mayo? And it was still 1925. But our lads anyway were delighted. They got their medals. My father was playing on the team. He came in from uh, from Killisolan and it says uh, All Ireland football champions won by Galway 1925. There was hundreds of people and Michael Donnellan arrived and uh, he had a big zodiac black Care. I'll never forget it. I used to think I'd love to go spinning it. And he had a box and he used to bring the box out, stand on the box, and he used to speak and he had a mighty voice. And God, I'd, you'd hear a penny drop in them times. And the man gave me a Tim Bob note. I'll never forget it. I was only about four at the time. I never saw a Tim Bob note. I never got one until I got it from him. My father played senior football with Galway from 1919 to 1933. He finished, in, he was born in 1900, but he finished in 1933 when he captained Galway. If he stayed on another year, as you know, Galway won the All-Ireland in 34, but I suppose he felt he was fairly old at that stage. I was in the Galway in the we young Columhain, Hugo Kerry, Dimashago Radio, some new Nijak Chirihin, Gunhedor. We shall be Hugo Kerry Gimmert, Glyphicanus Nahedan, Nijak Chirhagus Tree. Agus Wogan Kavan, or Murder Tun Ked, Hriva Gagavan, the Gustier Chagar Kool, the Scora Le Kavan, Stoyamas Kixir, Dad Slatamach on Gul, Gurbine, Hun Kavan, and Valach and Wu. Dar Gale Dahani Gulor to my Capuchin Polonamushin. For yet a quarter of the Maroon, Mariala Stoyan, the Priva, my other Holosh and Holskar Galia, Gabuina and Davia, Kolosh and Holskar Galia, Agus Elev, Shear, Free Vinturiski, Hoshikunda and the Galiva, Tagan Chor, Chimple and Amoshin, and Da Maroon, a haha. After my uncle, Hugo Kerry Ra, some good canish, Gumagansi, Hugo Harna, a hahadar, Agus Puyan Hushivila Shin. No, Gura set no Gansi Hedinta, a old Marilta, a Via Garner, or a Munachavog Kritalaku, Gura set Gansi Hedintaku, Iden Harner, Vidur Nu, Vidur Jess, Agus Gurha Karner, Yachin, Nugurha Gali Yachin, Ergush, or Hichin. Although Mick Donlan had retired after captaining Connacht to win the 34 Railway Cup in March, Galway beat Cavan in the 34 All Ireland semi final. They had a five-point win over Dublin in the Jubilee final and later that year travelled to New York. They were back in the final again in 38 and beat Kerry in a replay. Michael Rafe led the team around Croke Park in both games. My father was a great follower. He used to bring me to a lot of the games and I think it was in Mullingar against Monaghan, the All Ireland semi-final and it was the day that me all here made his debut with Radio Ayrton and bring the young lad out here, remember that, walk around with the team, and they won. And after that, then I had to go to Croke Park for the final. I remember the great Brendan Nestor's father, old JJ, and he coming out and bringing the, me and the other young, the Kerry mascot off. He was a shy lad, I remember he seeing him shake hands, he wouldn't shake hands with me. And for years afterwards, then I was known as mascot. And I was always good for getting old tender, or the truck in the a neighbour, my father was away somewhere, and he said there was a Pathia news on the, the old man. 
Royal Cinema. They brought me to the mall and I remember seeing the parade around. And after that, just memory. But, I, but they were lovely memories. Uh, beautiful, beautiful memories. ...by carrying the attack into the Kerry Half. But Kerry fight back and it's Ding Dong almost up to the interval. Just before half time, Galway score a brilliant goal. The Galway defence are hard pressed to keep out the dashing Kerryman. And if it weren't an all Irish match, you might almost say it was a case of Greek meeting Greek. Dubliner Bobby Beggs is one of a few players that has won senior medals with two different counties. He won the 1940 uh, two title for Dublin, but he also won the 1938 title for Galway. You see, the sad thing about it, if he had stayed in Galway, they'd probably have won the 1942 title, and Dublin would have been, you know, he was their, one of their key men. Mayo beat Galway again in 39, but Galway won their first National League title in 1940. Galway contested three All-Irelands and won one of them, 40, 41 and 42. Our um, representative and that was Gerald Canavan. Gerald played a lot of football. He played football in Dublin and he played football here and won county championships with us after coming back to Tune. It was extra time was being played when we were the draw. And I remember well, Charlie Sullivan was playing for Kerry, who I played with in Geraldines as well. And he got the ball about 40 yards, they had only one foot, and kicked it straight over the bar. Well, so 20 seconds later, the final whistle went, and we were beaten by a point. And Kerry, I think, beat us by two points the second time. And then my third year, I was still in Dublin, and I was playing for Geraldines. Harry Callan asked me to play with the... Would you play with Dublin? If you do, he said, you'll be captain because we were after winning the championship. Jesus hardly says I wouldn't be seen with them. And uh, I had refused the captain to say I wouldn't play with them. Well, no, I was after playing them two all Ireland with Galway. I ran out of town if I played with them. And I knew them, and we should have beaten them. But, like, once you're playing too much football, Galway have been 38, won the league in 39, all Ireland 90 40, 41, 42. It was getting too much, that the age goes off your game. And the Dublin team beat us, that shouldn't. If we met them, say, a week later, we'd probably have beaten them. Mick Fallon played at centre forward in the 42 final, having won both Ulster senior and junior medals with Cavan in 41, before being invited to play senior with Galway the following year. Cavan, they were playing tier one in the final, the Ulster final. It was the time of all the troubles and everything. And they, everyone had to get passports to go into Arma for the match. Everything was very strict. Kevin, team and players and the followers gathered at the border between Arma and Kevin. Got a, a British escort into Arma and were there on the ground all while the match was on. And uh, drove us back again to the border. But we won that match as well, that was Tolster Junior, Junior and Senior then. After the three in a row, we were back again in 45. That was the famous Jack Lynch era where he won six All-Irelands on the trot. I can remember clearly the All-Ireland semi-final that Galway played that year against Cork. The man that really impressed me was uh, Tom Sullivan, you know. He, he, uh, I can remember still Michal O'Hare raving about his display. Tom Sullivan would take on a team on his own. Tom Sullivan playing for centre half back. If Galway would get a penalty, he'd go up and score it. One hand into the air, left or right, left and right foot. A man so committed. I saw Tom when I was a kid. He'd be down in that parkland with a ball. Hour after hour, kicking, catching ball and so forth, practicing all the skills. I, I had a great love for Tom, great loyalty to him. I remember before he went to Australia, we leant over an old gate. None of, we hadn't many words, either of us. We exchanged a few words to him he was going to Australia. I said he was sorry to see him go. He went from Australia to America. He died in America. But Tom was a great hero of mine. Roscommon and Mayo dominated Connacht football for the next nine years. By 1952, Galway had gone 14 years without winning a senior title. 
but the county minor team brought much hope by winning the first minor title. Even though the county team was in the doldrums, the club championship was thriving. The 53 county final between Oak the Rard and Dunmore was filmed by Dunmore for release in the local cinema. In 53 we got together and uh, got over Banlaslow, the old enemy at the time, in the first round and serious training during the summer months. A native of Dunmore, Teddy Flynn, started training us. Jim Finnegan, who had the cinema here at the time, filmed the match, and not alone the match, but he filmed all the Dunmore people leaving from the square. The Kyos of Uthrard, their names in Galway football that have gone down and that will be remembered. Those seven Kyos playing football, would you believe it or not? And I remember well Ned Kyo playing with his bushy head of hair. God rest him, he's dead. I never knew him that well, but I know Father Hanwell and Father Joe and them lads, and many's the night I played poker with them. God knows, not alone are they, but they're good footballers, but good poker players as well. I can vouch for that. In the late 40s, along came an absolutely superb, gifted Mayo team uh, who were in hard luck not to win one All-Ireland in the late 40s. Then they compensated by winning two at the turn of the 50s. So as we swung into the 50s, Mayo were the dominant force in the land. It looked as if Mayo would be the team of the 50s, until one remarkable, amazing day in 1954 when Mayo came to Chum Stadium to wipe Galway off the pitch. And it didn't work out like that. The picking of the team was in the then Leiden's Hotel in Shop Street, Chum, uh, which is now the ACC building. And it literally was, and I've no doubt about this from talking to some of the personalities involved, uh, picked by Sean and one or two others while sitting in the stairs leading to the first floor of the hotel. Sean Purcell and Tom Dillon and I think Jack Mankin and Frank Stockwell had a powwow and I was told I was on the team. <laughs> and uh, as we went out the door of the dressing room, the officials were coming in and they weren't happy the miners had been beaten. John Dunn saw me and he said, um, put on your coat, it's raining. And I said, I'm playing, John. Oh Lord, help us, he says. Sean played uh, full-back, you know, he was so good he could play anywhere. That day he played full-back. Tom Langan had been one of the great players at full-forward. Dan O'Neill, well-known, of course, uh, in his work in tourism later on. He became a leading figure in the promotion of tourism in this country at national level. Dan had, had told me once that he was one of the players who went in for a while on Sean. Three Mayo men tried to mark him that day, they couldn't. Mayo had been on top for six years, but they were on the way down, I suppose. And, well. Windy day here in Chum, we got the break, we got the breaks we needed and we beat them by, I don't know, a few points I think. Any, any, any win was a good one that time. He was the strongest man I've ever come across and I, had, I, I was at the brunt of a stint one, one night in the street league, I was playing full back and he was in the twilight of a brilliant career at, at the, and I was at the, the I was at my peak which was never great. <laughs> But um, he said he was coming, he got the ball about 14 years out and he should have been playing for Bishop Street. Yeah. I was playing for, but he had defected at, yeah. a, at terrible expense at the time <laughs> to Ballygaddy Road. Yeah. But he got this ball about 14 years out and he was hitting towards me. And if you ever saw a small JCB running amok, it was yeah. the nearest thing I can imagine. He said, Tommy, can get out of my way, he said. Yeah. And I let on, I was going from, and, and I fell to let him over. <laughs> But he put the goalie, I don't know who he was, ball, everything, out onto the concrete steps of the Benoit net there that night. But I, I, I saw his strength. He was the, the physique of the man and the balance of the man. He was like a ballerina. And he could do anything with a ball. Galway were beaten by Kerry later that year in the All-Ireland semi-final. But there were signs of a major breakthrough. That breakthrough came in 1956. Billy O'Neill was selected as trainer, great army man and who always believed in physical fitness. And we went into training for the first round in Athenry. In 56, to our amazement down in Castle Bear, I think the score was 5-13 to 2-3. <laughs> Go on a bit beyond. But just this was something. We beat Roscommon and Roscommon in Shum by 1-19-02. Bigger crowds coming. The Connacht final by 2-12, I think it was to 1-3, we beat uh, Sligo in Markievicz Park. Uh, then on to Tyrone, who won the 
Ulster tight for the first time and came up to Dublin with marvellous uh, following, with something like 56,000. Towards the end of that game, Iggy Jones, who was only about 10 stone, he went in a zigzag solo round, something like Kevin Broderick in Croke Park. Uh, Jack Mangan advanced magnificently and he tried to top it over Jack's and Jack threw himself backwards. It was a brilliant save, yeah. Uh, Jack was Jack was my idol in the early days. A great goalkeeper, great goalkeeper in the air, tremendous in the air. And so to the parade, the Arcane Boys Band, the Pipers Band and of course the Battery of Cameramen photographed themselves for a change. And so to the teams, Galway and White, led by their captain Jack Mangan and Cork with Tony O'Sullivan showing the way. So the final against Cork today, of course, was Frank's day. He had a day out playing on uh, Donald so Sullivan of Cork. Scored two goals and five points that day. I think uh, it's a record that will always stand because it was over a one-hour game. All his scores came from uh, from play. And here's the Western Will o' the Wisp, Frankie Stockwell, through for Galway's number two. Frankie Stockwell and a Galway goal. The lively, sprightly Sean Purcell, and here he comes on one of his solo runs, chased by Dennis Bernard, but this time Sean does not score. Galway are not disturbed by this setback and come back attacking once more. And watch for Jerry Kerwin and this Galway point. Frank Ivers back to Sean Purcell, and the Tomb sharpshooter makes no mistake as half time approaches, with Galway leading two goals and six points to Cork's six points. And there's somebody in a hurry, maybe heading to these satisfied customers. Aiden Swords checks in for the restart, and once again it's Jerry Kerwin coming through. He passes to Stockwell. Stockwell is opposed by Donny Sullivan, but the little lad doesn't seem to worry as he sends it over the bar for another Galway point. Jackie Coyle and a point for Galway. Frank Ivers and yet another point. And perhaps the danger has gone for Galway. Yes, perhaps. Neil Fitzgerald leads an attack, slips the ball to Toots Keller and it sizzles to the top of the net. But back comes Coyle and relieves the situation for the Westerners. Oh, those fingers. With six minutes to go, Sean Purcell's free hits the upright, comes back into the parallelogram, and Paddy Tyres clears. Yes, time ticking away, and Galway going further ahead. And so, at the final whistle, Galway 2-13, Cork 3-7. The crowd cheering their heroes off. The crowd going home happy and satisfied. But truly, the happiest man in Croke Park Galway's captain, Jack Mangan, with the Sam McGuire Cup, received from Seamus McFadden. Ginny O'Shea has it now. For those who couldn't go to Croke Park to see Galway winning the league final in 1957, the old crystal radio and the voice of Michal O'Hare brought the passion of the game to supporters around the country. 40 yards out, now 30, now 21 yards out. He's doing a little sort of handy. He slips there. Ned Roach is coming out to watch him. And he left for a centre curling shot. They're dropping right down in the goal mouth. But they go to go. After winning the league final, Galway were rewarded with a trip to New York later in the year. We're three hours out. We left Shannon at 2 a.m. in the morning. We were almost three hours out when they discovered one of the engines had gone faulty. There was a bit of a smoke over it. And uh, we had to turn back to Shannon. Now, some of them were asleep and thought they were in New York when they arrived back. It threw things out of, out of focus a bit because the Americans were waiting for us on the far side. Like, and eventually we took off from Shannon and got in maybe 12, 14 hours later that they're bringing us on the plane from London or, uh, to Shannon to fly us. We played uh, New York in the final. It was a Brendan Cup final, I think, as well as a league final. Uh, it was a tough game, but uh, we managed to win anyhow. And probably the highlight of, of the celebrations for me over there was the Gollumin Association dinner. Everyone that was uh, anywhere in, from Gollum tried to be at that meeting. You know, to, to, to me, to him, done all night.
58, Dublin beat Galway in the league final by eight points. The teams met again in the All-Ireland semi-final in August. Dublin won by a point and started a winning record against Galway in the championship that is still intact today. We saw football in virtually the same terms and I think one thing that always impressed me about Galway teams, the better Galway teams, was the style with which they played football. There was always a bit of style, a bit of a land, a bit of culture about it as well as, you know, I'm not saying for a moment that they weren't well able to take care of themselves, I don't mean that. But they did play with a great style and a great verve. Meanwhile, in Ulster, Down were causing some upsets in the championship. And although beaten by Derry in 58, they looked formidable opposition for Galway in the 59 semi-final after beating Cavan in the Ulster final by 216 to seven points. Down were coming as a force, and we hammered them in the semi-final by 111 to 14. <laughs> And Yero Dick Sean Pershell at Ish, because Kurinche Gallon Keen, Le Cooley Nella. Cooley Nella Gallia, Egg Joe Young, and score Egg Let Om, Gallia Hui Cooley, and Don Ro Hooley. Sir Hickamach and Don, I told you all a Queen Musson, a Fawn Matty McDonough, who was born in Chisa Forky. Sir Hick Trahakuik Slat, I told you all a Sean Pershell, Cooley Nella Gukinte. Fjallir Jan Pörsjöl och Niro Degese Gjarnöj och han gick pinos när jag och Pörsjöl chanser behöver gullbåda. Tack och om du är där så kommer jag mörka klister, kul inte att jag ska nå njäl. Och han ger sig inte i vår nöjlighet och chanser be eller. Hur galet är det att jag ska gå Then we were favourites to be carrying the final. Before 87,000 people. Och så har ni gått och rannat här och har haltit Eamon de Valera. The Kerry team on the left of the screen was led by Mick O'Connell, Jeremy O'Shea, Dwyer, McAuliffe and Sean Murphy, while Sean Purcell, Frank Evers and Michael McDonough were in front for Galway. From a Sean Purcell pass, Frank Evers rushed through for a great goal to put Galway in the lead. The much pointed Kerry midfield of Michael O'Connell and Seamus Murphy had to give way in the early stages to Galway's Frank Evers and Matty McDonough. But always Sean Purcell passes to Frank Stockwell. Stockwell into Garrett. Now just watch this narrow escape for Curry. Coming from the left is Matty McDonough. Up to Joe Young. But Young shoots wide. Here's Joe Young again, and at this time he fists a Galway point. John Dowling gathers about 50 yards out, sends it high into the goal mouth. Jimmy Farrell catches it, but here comes McCullough from the right, and Kerry are well on their way to their 19th All-Ireland title. Then Sean Purcell, desperately seeking a goal, gambled on the ball being returned to him like this, but he shot too high and only scored a point. Meade clears for goal. Up to centre field, where Laid, number 13, moves it out. Out to Sean Purcell. Purcell rounds Dwyer, but again, this attack was of no avail. Frank Evers to Laid. But yet another Western effort finishes outside the post. And true to form, the player in the gap to repulse Galway's last attack was man of the match, Sean Murphy. As Murphy's kick reached Tom Long, referee John Dowling, no relation to the Kerry full forward, of course, sounded the final whistle, which ended the match, and which assuredly also was only the starting signal for the jubilant celebrations which the confident Kerry men had arranged before they even came to town. Apart from Matty McDonough, the remaining members of the 1956 team got their last Connacht medals in 1960 against Leitrim. Galway lost the All-Ireland semi-final to Kerry. If the dedication was there, if they had the same dedication as we had, they, they certainly would have won another All-Ireland if not true. Of course, again, I was on the team that lost the 1960 All-Ireland semi-final to Kerry. We weren't really ready for that at all.
Galway were well represented on All-Ireland Day by a group of very promising minors who had a big win over Cork. Cork in their blue jerseys and Galway in their white. Cork went into the lead after several minutes of pressure and it was then that the Galway line of Gay Lowen, Noel Tierney, Larry O'Brien was tested to the full. The Connacht defence was equal to the task, however, and gave the Cork boys little scope. Soon the Galway lads were on the offensive again, and this was the second of four great goals that rocked the monster net and set the Connacht miners on the high road to victory. At half-time, Galway held a six-point lead and were playing so well that few doubted their ability to stay in front to the end. And so it proved with Leyden, Slattery, Cleary, Gavin and Prendergast ready and eager to snap up every scoring chance that came their way. Galway deserved every point of their winning margin. And In 1960 I came on the um, Galway minor team. A, a number of the players that have played with me afterwards were on that very same minor team. In fact, I think there were six in all. Uh, Johnny Garrity, Enda Colloran, Noel Tierney, Seamus Leyden, Sean Cleary and myself. And uh, in fact, there was a minor team of the previous year as well, in which Pat Donlan, uh, John Keenan and Cyril Dunn also played. So nine of us from that particular minor team, those two minor teams, played senior in 1964 together. Now, the following year, I was minor again. And I suppose if I, if I used my birth certificate, I might have been a minor three years when I was born at Christmas. But uh, I had two great years playing minor. I, I did the leave in 1960. And right after that, I got a letter from John Dunn, who was the secretary of the football board at the time, saying that they wanted me for a match down against Tipperary. So down I go and played in the match. And I'll never forget, I came back and my father said to me, how'd you get on, Pat? She says, I, says, I think I got on fairly well. And the next Sunday, Galway were playing Sligo in the first round of the championship. So anyway, we were training away. They picked the team. And I remember meeting my father, says, how are you doing there, Pat? Are you playing on the team someday? Oh, jeez, I says, I'm not on the team at all. I says, they didn't select me. They picked me as a sub. I says, they can go to blazes now. I says, I won't show up at all. And he says to me, hold on a minute, Pat, you can't do that. you got to go there and hang in there. So the guy that was picked, funny enough, at left half forward was a great friend of mine, George Glenn. Now, George and I were to be involved in Sigerson football in Galway, and we're still the best of mates. But the ironic thing happened in that match. Didn't they take off George and put me on? So I was on, you might say, all the time then until 1970. One story in the history of Galway football has a simple title, but a title that tells it all, really, the day the crossbar broke. It was 1962, the game was in uh, Castlebar, the game was against Roscommon. Uh, it was, as it turned out, faithfully, Sean Purcell's last game for Galway, the last day that he wore the maroon. It wasn't the way that Sean would like to have gone out, but that's the way it was. Galway were leading, and leading midway through the second half, when one of the great goalkeepers of all time, Aidan Brady, uh, went up to field the ball and swung off the crossbar as was often done at the time. Indeed, it was done in soccer and other sports as well. The crossbar came down and in the period of time that elapsed while the crossbar was, was, uh, was being repaired, Galway decided to rest Frank Ivers and to take him off. And in taking off Frank Ivers, it opened the door for Jerry O'Malley to come up the field because from centre half back he didn't have the strength uh, and the raw determination of the charismatic Ivers, one of the great glamour figures of, of, of the game in Galway down through the years. The man who, you know, outplayed Mick O'Connell in 1959 All-Ireland. When Ivers was gone, the door opened for Roscommon, O'Malley started thundering up the field, the scores came, and almost before people had realised it, the game was over. The crossbar was broken, the crossbar was fixed, Roscommon's uh, challenge was fixed as well, Galway were undone, Sean, who lined out that day at full forward, didn't play for Galway again. The curtain came down on a distinguished and glittering career. It was the end of a golden, golden, but never to be forgotten era. Uh, as I say, sadly, Roscommon didn't go on to win it, but it, it was one of the days in Galway football. And I was there as a 12-year-old standing just behind the goal, and I saw the crossbar come down, little realising then that, you know, it would live in the memory, that incident. I never saw them playing but I heard about their feet I want to get the ball know where the other one would be
a phrase came into vogue. It was probably McDonne uh, of the then Irish press, the leading Gaelic Games writer probably in the country at the time, and a great friend of Frank Stockwell, and also of Sean, of course, uh, who would have coined that phrase. But the phrase, of course, was the terrible twins. That was Sean Purcell and Frank Stockwell. Uh, they grew up together in Bishop Street, ironically, the same street that produced Jackie Mangan, who was the captain of the 1956 team. Uh, Frank Stockwell was small in stature, but a gifted footballer and very, very tough. Uh, nobody messed with Frank Stockwell because, in fact, in his youth, he was a champion boxer at national level. When they won all Ireland gold, Frankie scored a record: five points, two great goals, all from play in 60 minutes. Wherever there's talk of football, you've heard of Junie Loftus, of course, the great Junie, the pub, and of course we've all heard of the, the terrible twins. Junie always maintained that Junie went to America in the early 50s. And Joni said if he'd never gone to America, there'd be no terrible twins, with the terrible triplets. 63 saw so, um, almost all the crew that took part in 64, 5 and 6 reached all Ireland fine and were beaten on that day, of course. Uh, some people would say it was bad refereeing decisions, it was this, that and the other, but you wouldn't know, I don't know whether we were ready enough for it. Park. President de Valera and 87,000 see the big match get started. Irish football's a game like no other. Just a reminder, Galway are in the dark shirts. This code is a mixture of soccer and rugby with some of the refinements of all-in wrestling. If the ball goes over the bar between the posts, it counts one point. So this is one for Galway. <laughs> Dublin retaliates, a point for them. If the ball goes in under the bar, it's a goal. Three points. The game's fast and furious. Very little between the sides as yet. And at half-time, it's Dublin four, Galway six. So the second half looks like being a sizzler. Dublin are first to put on the pressure. A point for Dublin. Jerry Davy gets a goal for Dublin. Galway's captain, Mick Garrett, starts a promising attack. The ball goes to Seamus Layden. He punches a brilliant point, but it's Dublin's victory. So, in the presence of Mr. De Valera, Des Foley receives the cup, Dublin's 17th capture of the trophy. That was a final we certainly should have won on if we were so inexperienced, because we had all the play, we seemed to be all over them but we didn't get the scores and then they, they uh, scored a rather soft goal in the end. But uh, I, I think that it was a good thing that that happened to us with such a young team because we knew after that and, and that we had the winning of one All-Ireland at least or a few more All-Irelands and then we decided that very evening, that very night in the dressing room that we'd rally together and make a supreme effort to win the All-Ireland the following year and that we did. With John Donlan as captain, Galway were back in the final again in 64. His father, Mick, had been ill coming up to the final. I often remember one man in particular, he'd always wind up by saying, you'll never be half as good a man, Pat, as your father. You know the way you always feel your own generation are the best. And I suppose this man felt like this. But a funny thing that it was, my father was bald. And I used to think that all good footballers were bald. Well, on the Saturday morning here, um, he didn't know whether to go or not. And eventually I, I persuaded him, he says, I'd like to see you there. You know, I want you to be there. And um, he eventually went along with that. The All-Ireland Final. The Toy Sark, Sean Limas and many more distinguished persons see the doughty men of Galway kicking right to left, go into the attack against those all but invincible finalists, Kerry. And there's a point for Galway right away. The 75,000 jamming Croke Park realise they're going to see a vintage final. A foul against Kerry. Free kick to Galway. The kick is taken by Cyril Dunn and it's another point for Galway. They're not in the least awed by Kerry's reputation. Beaten by Dublin by the narrowest of margins last year, Galway play like men inspired, determined to win today. Kerry are no less resolved to prevent them and win a point here. It's Galway 7, Kerry 3 at half-time. Kerry realised that a deficit of four points isn't serious at this stage. 
They attack and are stopped by a foul. The free kick yields carry a point. Galway seem much the faster team and are worth more than their meagre lead of three points. They take up the attack now. Straight between the posts goes a punched ball from Matty McDonough. Point for Galway. Galway have the bit between their teeth now. The ball goes to Sean Cleary. He punches one more for Galway. At the end, Galway win 15-10. Their captain, John Donnellan, goes up to receive the Sam Maguire Cup. He doesn't yet know that his father died while watching the game. Tragedy and triumph. My father was 64 years of age uh, when he died. He was born in 1900. And I'd say that if he was to choose a place to go, I'd say Crow Park would be probably number one. Number one. But Dad was ailing, there's no question about it. But then again, when one of your own is ailing, you know, or you don't seem to, uh, you don't seem to uh, suspect that there's anything wrong. You know, and did it get more young at the time? The following year, Galway met their old rivals Kerry in the league final. A ball handled near the ground by Matty McDonough, with Kerry leading by two points and two minutes to go, is still a talking point today. He kicks it high, well up the field. Matty McDonough trying to get up to it. Succeeds, but the ball breaks down. It goes back to Matty. Matty going through with the ball. Tipped it now to Seamus Layden. Layden going through. Takes a shot, and it's the goal. Ball broke for me, and I was I was getting up off the ground, having what I considered being fouled seconds before that. But the ball came back my way, and I stuck a left hand out and grabbed it. Got up and hopped the ball, and found my Layden running in front of me and roaring for the ball and he took it on the run and he shot just over Cullity his hands into the net and with the kick out the full time whistle and it broke the hearts of the Kerrymen because even Mick O'Connell said to me afterwards I think if he kept playing us in the 60s we'd never have won any All-Ireland in the end of the 60s he said so we had a trip to New York for it. We were on five dollars a day after the first few days if you left the hotel and stayed with someone Sean Mead and myself in Cerdal Dome, we stayed with Sean's sisters who were living in New York. We got $14. After coming back from America, Galway reached the 65 final against Kerry by beating Down in the semi-final. This was their fourth important meeting in three years, so clearly the rivalry was intense. Take a freeze for the Galway men as Pat Donald comes up now to take this free. He takes it high and it is over the bar, a point for Galway, scored by Pat Donald from 50 yards out. And the score 10 to 7 in favour of Galway. As Mick Morris sends his high ball in towards the centre, Matt Muir kicking it out. Mick Morris getting ready to draw it and root it way up the field towards Christy Tyrrell. Christy Tyrrell tapping it out to the oncoming Cyril Dunn. Cyril Dunn going right, then left. Now trying to sell more dummies to Seamus Murphy. It's not an easy sale, but he's half succeeding. He has succeeded. Up to Matty McDonough, up and on the right. Matty cutting into the centre. Paul O'Donoghue holding on to him and there's a free for Galway. Just over 14 yards out from the Kerry goal, halfway between the sideline and the goal on our right, and Cyril Dunn to take it. Ten points to seven in favour of Galway. Johnny Cullity hit at the goal, anxiously watching to see where this ball is going to hop or is it going to go over the bar. And it's gone over the bar, a point for Galway. So it behoves Kerry at the moment to get as much play into that game as possible in an effort to pull down this lead. And Mick O'Connell getting the ball for the kick out. Outside of Jerry O'Shea. Jerry O'Shea being chased by John Donnellan. Jerry O'Shea still going on. John Donnellan at the home by the trousers. And oh Jerry and John. No. Jerry O'Shea brought down by John Donnellan by the trousers there. But uh, apparently uh, they didn't uh, like it too well. Five to thirty years later, 
I was at the race in Tralee and didn't I meet the guy for the first time? <laughs> Again, um, a fellow called O'Shea, and that was the first time I met him since uh, we departed Crow Park. We had a great old chat, we had a few drinks, and he was down in Dunmore with John Keenan oh, there a couple of years ago. And we had a couple of more drinks, and I had no bad feeling at all. You know. But I would say one thing, <laughs> well, by the time we had finished with Gary in 1965, you know, uh, there were no angels. You know, uh, they had felt the brunt of uh, our success and they weren't a bit, bit happy with us. Later in the year, however, Galway were shocked by Down in the grounds Joel tournament final. Brian Johnston to Paddy Doherty. And Paddy Doherty has a chance. And so a beautiful ball in the back of the net. And Down now lead one goal and two points to Galway's three points to Paddy Doherty. No delay with Doherty into Sean O'Neill, but beaten this time. To Ray Morgan, he tries a high one and sends it over the bar. And the ball's in the net. To tell you nothing but the truth, we motivated ourselves. And we were highly motivated. We wanted to win. And we worked at it and put our heart and soul into it. Because we weren't, we weren't, as I said, the most talented bunch of footballers that ever got together. But we were probably one of the most loyal, and we're still loyal to one another. On the yard line, Galway created further doubt in the minds of their supporters by losing the 66 league final to Longford. On the wing, to Sean Donnelly on the 21 yard line. Donnelly is on the ground. He's surrounded by two Galway men. He's trying to work his way through. He sends the ball to Jim Hannafy. Hannafy is fouled, and there's a free for Longford, dead straight in front of the goal. 14 yards out, dead straight in front of the goal. Another free for Longford. And Bobby Burns, the misser of the last two, the scorer of so many to take this one. And already he's in agony. His two hands up around the back of his head. I wonder what he's saying to himself right now. Here comes his kick. And it's the lead. Now, it's right into the goal mouth. And it's over the bar for a point. And the missing of that earlier puck shot in front of the goal is surely forgiven by Galway after that shot from an impossible angle. And Cyril Dunn has put Galway ahead with less than two minutes left in the game. And Seamus Lake cutting through now for Galway. He it out Galway were in trouble for long periods of the Connacht final against Mayo. But Cyril Dunn and Liam Salmon came to the rescue in the closing minutes. Nick racing across into the centre now. Jimmy Duggan pleading for the ball on the far side. He's got it. He takes his shot. It's deflected. And it's held up along the corner now. It's a point. It's a point by Liam Salmon. A point by Liam Salmon for Galway to put Galway into the lead. 1966, I walked between London and Brighton. And I remember distinctly every evening, there was another member of the team with me, Bosco McDermott. And I'd insist that we'd stop work at a certain time and we'd go training. And we did. We trained hard. And we came back for the semi-final against Cork and Bosco was bad and I was worse and the whole team performed very badly but thank God we won and we were saved of course by Johnny Gerrity that day. Bosco McDermott with a kick out now out towards this side of the field running onto it all on his own Pat Donlan Pat up the field with it now right in towards Matty McDonough moved back in full forward now he's gone in full forward he's out on the right corner working his way through Matty forcing his way through, across into the centre. Cyril Dunn, it's a goal! It's a goal! Cyril Dunn, the scorer! Matty McDonough got the ball one day in some match, I forget it. And Seamus Layton was clear on his left and he didn't pass the ball to him. Probably, probably he didn't see him. And my brother said to him after the match, if you do that again, he says, I'll tear the b****s off you. They must pass the ball. And like, that illustrates it. Now, Matty never held that against my brother. They were good friends always and are good friends to this very day. But, like, the team thing was very important to us because, uh, like, the ball was thrown around. We didn't care who scored as long as Galway scored. I know people have put uh, oh, different uh, emphasis on that and, and they're inclined to say, oh, John Dallin was injured. Look, John Dallin was well fit to play. I was dropped by John Dunn, ably assisted by every one of the twelve. Some of them I tried to talk to from time to time about it. One talked to me. 
you know. And it, it was, you know, it was a number of the capital job. And were it not for the fact that uh, I had, uh, I was a TD, a Finnegan TD, well, it would not have happened. And I'm as convinced as that. And I would add uh, as well, I'll have to say this, that uh, I noted that once I was elected, well, uh, the local papers, or in their view at least, it appears, from what I could read, and I can read, I never just happened to play as well again in their view. Although they had qualified for the final, the last four displays and the fact that Meade had looked so impressive against Down left people unconvinced that Galway would win the coveted three in a row. They shot clearly on the 14 yard line as they shot it, it's a point! About 40 yards out from the Meade goal and Cyril Dunn gone across to take it, about 15 to 20 yards into the far sideline. Cyril Dunn, the kicker, as he walks up now. High and over the bar, a point for Galway. John Keenan back to Seamus Layden. Red Collier racing after him, but Seamus Layden still with the ball. Into John Keenan. John Keenan is shot and it's high and it's over the bar. And from the kick out, the ball going. No, Liam Salmon doesn't let it go over the sideline. He gets it and sends it up on the right wing to Cyril Dunn. Jack Quinn comes out, tackles him. Uh, but the referee waves on the play, the ball across the front of the goal, it's a goal! <laughs> but it's the Galway man who gets it, Jimmy Duggan, to Liam Salmon. Liam Salmon, high, right over the bar, and it's another point for Galway. He manages to get it into Seamus Layden, Seamus Layden is shot over the bar. to Jimmy Duggan, Jimmy Duggan to Pat Gondon on his own 50, now 60, about to be 70 and then he drop kicks it away up the field, gone back for it is Jack Quinn, Jack Quinn about 35 yards out from the Mead goal, sends it up field but Pat Gondon is there again, 70 yards out from the Mead goal, 60 yards out from it, 50, 40, 30 and he tipped it into John Keenan, John Keenan on the 21, the shot is high and it's over the bar, a point. Red going the wrong way, still tipping the ball around, gets it back to Matty McDonough, to John Keenan, John Keenan from 30 yards out, high and over the bar, another point. And this three will be taken by Martin Newell, just short of 70 yards out from the Mead goal. And on the ground, Galway playing a lot of ground football today, up now to Seamus Layden, going up along the left wing, Red Collier is after him, Seamus is still going up, He's Lost the ball, nobody gets it into the centre. Matty McDonough with it now on the 14 yard line, fits it high and a point. And out comes the ball into the centre of the field. The referee is calling for the ball, and Galway are all Ireland champions. Yes, Pat Donlan running round with the ball in the centre of the field. He's running harder now, nearly, than he did during the game. Arakar Vinaka, Arakar, Agusan Kharjanig. It's more an honour, Agusan privilege, Domsa. Behama Hassan Shah. It was. It was a great, great honour, really, you know, because looking at the history of Galway football and all the great captains, it was a very daunting task in a way, you know. But lucky enough, things worked out well for me. And like, let's say, the first match, you'd be very nervous, saying, look, am I fit to do this? How is it going to go? So on and so forth. How am I going to play with the added responsibility of being captain? But thank God things worked out very well. I remember my first trip to Crow Park was in 66. I can see it vividly standing in the hill. I remember being on the hill and the Galway players came out and they were kicking around. And I could see uh, Bosco and Noel Tierney and in the, in the full back line and you know they looked like giants. They looked huge. But it was a, it, it, it was a great time, like it was a great experience for me for my first trip to Crow Park to see Galway win that Halle and to win it so decisively like you know. There would be a lot of guys that I would have known in that team, as I said, Inda would be from my own club and 
Johnny Geraghty played with, the, with, with, with my own club and Matty, of course, big Matty from down the road in Belligar, just from me as well. Like I mean, it, 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 it was really great times and it was something that you'd always aspire to, to say someday you might get out and play in Crow Park. But, you know, uh, when it happens then it's, 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 it's really great. Noel Tierney was definitely the best full back I ever saw playing. You'll have to understand Noel's position in relation to uh, Trent. Noel w was a farmer. He was running a farm on his own. He hadn't as much time maybe to play football as some of the rest of us. But he was an extraordinary talented footballer. Now, in today's game, he wouldn't be a good fullback because the game has changed. But in the 1960s and that time, and I'm sure all the period before that, because the game there wasn't as much running up to that, he is good as anything that is around. He wasn't an awfully tall man, but a man of exceptional build with long hands. And he, they were, I described them at once as like shafts of carts. You know, the funny thing about it, I look back in it, and, uh, you know, I, I'd address this remark now to Inter Calvin more so than anybody else, is that Inder, you are the one that has been kind of selected and said, he is the automatic right full back on this team, that team, and the other team. And I'd say this race could be, you are no better back than any one of us. You know, uh, you could trust your life with McDermott, with uh, Matt Newell, with Sean Mead. And if I was to pick one back in all that time, who, not all the time, but on his day, could play better than anyone I ever saw, you know, uh, before that and certainly since that, and that was no tell me. John Morley to take the free. In 1968, Galway reversed the 67 final result against That's Mayo. Put it out to the far side of the field and the colour now to a Johnny Farrer, but Johnny seemed to get there quicker. Up to Joe Langham, out near the sideline. And Joe takes a shot from the side and the drops right across in front of the goal and it is a goal! After winning three in a row, I thought in 1967, uh, had the team been handled correctly, that we would have won another All-Ireland because we uh, went on a trip to the States. We were two weeks over there, played matches, so on and so forth. We came home on the following weekend, we went to Wembley to play in Wembley. And then we came home for that and we got started training very hard for another week. And by the time uh, the, the game came, we were really tired on our feet. We were very, very tired. I think that had we not trained as hard, we'd have been fresher. And if we got over the first round of the championship, I think we definitely could have gone on to win another All-Ireland. A lot of players were dropped from the team, and really they should not have been dropped. That team should have been, that panel should have been kept together. And if the players were handled rightly, uh, and uh, some of them allowed rest and then trained hard when the championship came along, then they'd be there for another championship at least. When the time comes, to go and see their neighbor, their, their own sons or their neighbor sons in Crow Park, they get a bad old ticket and you know, they'd be, you'd be looking, they give you a view of the Dublin Mountains. Of course, it may be a time to come in, come in they'd even chat it more for that. They're putting you up good and high and looking at the Dublin Mountains. You know, I, I firmly believe this, that if I went to Crow Park and there was a scarcity of ticket, and if Bill Clinton and Monica and Lewinsky are right, Bang, there's no problem with tickets for them. But of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing to have. And anyone can have it. But if I was to have my scene over again, I wouldn't get involved with the GA at all. And then I'd be honest with you, I made a terrible mistake to have led my kids in that direction. Two goals against Roscommon in 1970 set up Galway for a semi-final meeting with me, which they lost by four points. Out there is Liam Sam. Into the centre to Willie Joyce's shot and it's a goal! Corley McDonough, Mac uh, McDonough there, hooshing. Ken Rennick's off the ball, out comes Pat Dunlan for the ball from his left corner position. Sends it right through up the centre, it's gone through. And now it's Tommy Keenan, he's on the 14, he takes his shot and John McCormick save! Back out to Jack Quinn. Oh, a great save there by Sean McCormick. And Michael Fay will take it. And it is the equaliser, Michael Fay the scorer. 
And that makes it eight points for Galway, eight points for me. And there it is, the lead for me. Galway won their third minor title in 1970 in a replay against Kerry. John Campbell, the Shinkiki Mark of Rose, the Tall of the Tosh, the Store Ocon, the Store Ocon, the Gear, the Shaka Shabul, the Shaka Shabul, the Obras, the Ganaka, Alfie attacked the Mark, the Shabel, the Shabul, the Alfie, the Parlon, the Shay. The Howley family have been involved in retailing for over 100 years. Since its opening in February 2000, Eurospar has brought the best of European style shopping to Dunmore and surrounding areas. The shop includes an extensive hot and cold deli area, an off license, news agents, and fresh food departments. The busy coffee shop serves lunches and snacks throughout the day. Galway Bay FM is the local radio station that covers Galway City and County and in its 11 years history the station has consistently enjoyed the number one slot in the listenership surveys. This success has been built around a strong local broadcasting team. Galway Bay FM is your station. We're here to serve you. Pork McGann, nutrition for life. Get with the game of life. You need those extra nutrients back in your system to give you all the extra energy and make you feel strong and healthy again. Call Porrick McGann at Nutrition for Life. Visually stunning inside and out, the Radisson SAS Hotel in Galway commands a city location, yet sparkles with the light and air of nearby Lockatolia. The hotel's 205 guest rooms and suites, 12 confidence suites, Borden panoramic suite, Inish Moor ballroom, entertainment centre and leisure centre, all combine cutting-edge technology with luxury. Step inside, the difference is genuine. N17, the biggest and brightest electrical and furniture superstore in the West. With top brands and free delivery, N17 electrical and furniture superstore. Proud to be associated with the Tommy Varden History of Galway football video. At Givago Sound and Vision, we stock the largest selection of compact discs, DVDs and videos. Special orders welcome. Call us now at 091-509960. Big fall to Roth. City West Hotel, Conference, Leisure and Golf Resort, Sagard County, Dublin. City West Hotel has presidential suites, executive rooms and meeting capacity for up to 6,000 people. A large leisure centre, a pool and two golf courses designed by Christy O'Connor Jr. City West Hotel. Nobody could see the, the, the lean times come again and... Um, there maybe was one or two lean years after the trainer wrote him, but it was just re rebuilding and then there was a team assembled again and uh, we found ourselves in All Ireland final again. There, just as uh, Noel Connor followed his man out, it's Willie Joyce with the ball now to Frank Canavan. Canavan trying to get inside, take the shot and there's the equaliser. 35, oh, 40 yards out from the off we go. And Martin Furlong brings it down in the goal mouth, and it's a goal! It's a goal, a goal for Galway, and uh, Seamus Layton the scorer, Seamus Layton the scorer. Here's Liam Salmon, now Jimmy Duggan, now Frank Canavan, still Frank Canavan. A shot at a point by Frank Canavan. Nice passing movement right up from the centre of the field. Frank Canavan finishing it off. The memory of that day was the terrible rain and, and wind that came up at half time and that we had to face into in the second half, which played a major part in, in, in the outcome of the game. Willie Joyce to Lean Salmon. And Frank Canavan has the ball in front of the goal. A shot and he has stepped it over the bar. Jordy Sneerance, Jordy Cunning coming out for it, Liam Salmon, and that ball is very, very greasy, Bert Connor now for Offley, Mert from 40 yards out high and over the bar, a point for Offley by Mert Connor, narrowing the gap now to just four points between them, into Tom Divley, Tom Divley left for a screw shot across in towards the goal mouth, and the ball is in the net, it's a goal, it's a goal, it's a goal and it was scored on the top of the left by Seamus Layden.
Seamus Layden went across. He was the one who jumped in. Beaten by Offaly in 71. Cork in 73 and Dublin in 74. You know, it was the beginning and the end in 66. In 1972, Galway beat Kerry to win their first and only under-21 title to date. We were beaten early in the championship in 72 by Roscommon. So, uh, 73 we made it right through to, to the all Ireland final. While we played quite well, we were comprehensively beaten in 73. There is no doubt about it, we were beaten by a better team in uh, Cork. I think uh, we scored 2.13 in that year and lost the all Ireland. You know, so we could have absolutely no qualms about that. We were beaten by a better team. down and Jimmy Barry with that great effect of quick thinking of his that has got them here There was a ball today. going wide early on. I think Jimmy Barrett, who was corner forward, knocked it back into the middle and Jimmy Barry was there to slap it down into the net with his two hands. It wasn't a great goal, but it was a goal that uh, gave Cork a big lift, set us back a bit. Cork full forward line were, were, were lethal. You had uh, Jimmy Barrett, of course, and uh, Jimmy Barry Murphy, and they were not guys to be throwing the ball or leaving it loose around the square. <laughs> I'll tell you, no better boys to, to put it away. Into the centre, and this is Dennis Collin from Dennis Long. Dennis Collin, a lovely one, and it's over the bar! By the way, Jack Cosgrove is wearing a pair of boots that he bought in Ray Cummins' sports shop in Cork. And they seem to work all well, I bought a pair of football boots, I didn't say they were for the All-Ireland. I don't know, had we uh, beaten off in the semi-final, but I know I wore a pair of boots in the final from that I bought from Ray Cummins uh, and there was Mark and Ray Cummins so I couldn't have kicked him too hard if I got a chance not that, I was not that I was going to anyways and being robbed by Johnny Hughes still Johnny Hughes and a very nice bit of robbery and delivery this is Mick Rooney into the centre to Jimmy Duggan Jimmy now 60 yards out Running on to Morris Burke now, Morris Burke cutting inside, his shot and it's over the bar! Declan Barron, Ned Kirby. And Cork really motoring now, Dave McCarthy in front of the goal! 21, 14 yards out, off Jack Cosgrove who drove right down to the ball, out to Jimmy Barrett and over the bar! And Jimmy Duggan, inspired by that move, getting that ball and coming upfield, being chased by Dennis Collin, still Jimmy Duggan. Now Jimmy Duggan recovering and sending it high and sending it over the bar. And what's happening right now is that Dennis Collin sends the ball upfield. TJ Gilmore bursting his way through, bursting his way through and still going on, whether it's the crowd or what, I don't know. He's coming into his shooting position. He's on the 21, he takes a shot and he sends it over the bar. Tommy Joe was really a class player and a really, really, really good, powerful player. I remember him going up the field that day and he was knocking lads like you'd be, like you'd be cutting small trees <laughs> to were falling in front of him. <laughs> At that stage, Tommy could have, could have blasted a ball into the net. He blasted one over the bar. Yeah. I was lucky enough to get up and blast one into the net. <laughs> afterwards. 74, a, a kind of a new era had dawned and this new t hype about management and Hefo's army arrived and different types uh, of approaches to training uh, came into being at that time. Nobody trained through the winter in those days and we started training in October. We were playing Clare and Kilkenny and Wexford and Limerick and they weren't the strongest teams and it gave us an opportunity to First of all, build up a fitness, and we set that as an objective to be the fittest team in the country. Now, it, was, it wasn't too hard to do that in, in those days. And uh, we suddenly saw that, that working hard and uh, working through the winter had its own reward because we were able to outlast any team we played at that stage. And he's still going on. He fits it in and it is over the bar. Jack Cosgrove up now to Jimmy Duggan. Still Jimmy on the 14, on the 21. Jimmy Duggan for Galway. After just over two minutes of play. Stephen Rooney. And that's an O2 grabbing a hold of that one. This is Tony Hanahoe now for Dublin. Tony Hanahoe was... was 
was really the key. His responsibility was to tempt the centre half back over the centre and leave room for balls to be played up the middle and for Mullins and Bernard Brogan, who had great pace, to be coming through the middle, or Stephen Rooney, to be coming through the middle all the time. I know for a fact that Tony Hanahoe and I marked each other that day and I think we, we spent the day chasing each other after we were saying, was there a ball in that game at all? Because we'd, none of us seemed to have it, you know. That year when the All-Star nominations came out, Tony was the only one of the 15 who wasn't nominated. And it was only the following year that people suddenly realised the contribution he was making and how vital it was to the team. When we beat Offaly, which was the third match, who had been champions two years before, in a, in a tough Dour kind of game, uh, people began to realise that we might have been more serious of a challenge than people thought. Uh, we went on then, and uh, I suppose beating Cork, who were the holders in the semi-final, was a major shock. And then the seventh game was against Galway. Now, Galway had some very superior players and experienced players at that stage. Liam Salmon, Jimmy Duggan, Mick Judge, uh, and uh, Tommy Joe Gilmore. They were certainly favourites and they were expected to win. And uh, as, as it turned out, we won. It wasn't a particularly spectacular game except for the winners. And uh, I suppose Galway were both, uh, they were shocked and surprised. And George Cody McDonough. Cody being chased now by Robbie Kelleher. Made a little bit too long with it, but it's worked all right for Galway still. Tom Nocton tackled there by Alan Larkin, but uh, Alan gets the ball back, or uh, Tom Nocton gets it back. Tommy Sands, Lane Salmon, David Hickey down there on the zone end line, Harrison. And it's a goal, Michael Rooney! A goal for Galway, scored by Michael Rooney! And here it is again, the ball coming in from the wing, high across in front of the goal. He's outside the parallelogram, there's no argument, kicked it in by Michael Rooney, and Galway lead, one goal and one, two, Dublin, three points. Out along the wing now to Anton O'Toole. Anton, too quick with the sidestep there for Joe Waldron. And he's still going on. He fits it in, and it is over the bar. Joe Waldron... Judging that one very well, John Tobin. In now to Tom Nocton, and here comes Nocton. And it is over the bar, another point scored by Tom Nocton. And this is Michael Rooney. Paddy Ryder coming in after him. Michael selling dummies wholesale and picking off a lovely point. Lovely point there by Michael Rooney, moves to the half forward line. I think our main problem was that we didn't have a free taker. We lost Joe McLaughlin from Mike Holland in 71. Joe was a specialised free taker. If you don't have a specialised free taker, you, you're, you miss out on a lot of scores. They brought back Jimmy Keaveney. Now, Jimmy wasn't super fit, but he was very effective. Out on the field, he'd have plenty of chat, and uh, it wouldn't be always friendly, but sure, we were both, we're all like that. But he was very strong, very hard to get around. Uh, great target man for Dublin and a uh, great free taker. Jimmy Keaveney takes it and Jimmy Keaveney sends it over the bar. A point for Dublin, the first score in the second half. And now there's only one point between them. Michael Rooney. Having the game of his life since he developed into a senior here today. He's having a really fine game. Getting that ball out now to Tom Nocton. John Tobin. And he gets away from Gail Driscoll this time. And Pat Sands now with the ball. Into the center to Liam Salmon. Liam Salmon take, tried to take a shot. And the referee has gone for the ball. And it is a penalty. A penalty for Galway. Here it comes. And he saved it. He saved it. Oh, Paddy Cullen! Paddy Cullen has saved it! They're in cheering him and all the rest. Here's the shot! And he gets his hand to it. I can still see Paddy Cullen lying on the ground and all that kicking the ball again. It was easier to, to, to knock it in behind him or over him, you know. But, like, that's it. That's the way it is. 
to win matches, you must get the scores, and we just didn't get a, enough of scores. Our forwards just didn't click on the day. And we had some very talented forwards, but you know, you got to be able to put the ball away when you get the chances. We got a lot of chances that day now. I mean, people will always refer to Liam Salmon's penalty miss. Well, I would say that was a miss, but certainly not by any means our greatest miss. The Jacks are back all right, and the way they're playing right now, the Galway backs are Jacks. Very near the end of the game now, 14 points for Dublin, one goal and six for Galway. Kevin Heffernan down there telling them to stay back from the end line. Referee going down to tell them the same thing. I always maintained that that match never ended. I was kicking out the ball at the time and we were defending the goal in front of the Hill 16 and most of the Dublin supporters had come over the fence at the back of the goal and they were lined right along the end line and I had to go back among them to get a run to kick out the ball. And he ran out to the middle of the field and then made a beeline from the rest of the room. You know the dog and stuff. And where was he running from? Because God made a well, they're not known as a, a wild uh, race of supporters that they'd attack a referee. Now you couldn't, hey, the Dubliners might have had to go. So the, there was no need for the Dubliners to have to go, but he was after handing it to the man that played. We were roaring favourites in many ways, you know, that because of, of where they came from and uh, they hadn't got the background that we had, you know, we were after coming from two All Ireland final defeats and and everyone sort of expected that we would win it on the day. But, you know, we didn't get the rub of the green and we didn't get the green flag that we should have possibly at one stage as well. Things were good for me. I got Football of the Year in Galway, got a Nolls there, and, you know, I was on a high. I was saying, you know, I'll have plenty of time. Yeah. But, um, actually, 75 turned out to be quite a disappointing year. I was captain of the team. We were beaten by Sligo in the first round. And I remember uh, on that particular occasion, you know, Galway were trying to beef up the scoring rate and Pattian, the great Pattian was brought back into the scene for that uh, championship match. And I, I can remember on the Monday after I think the papers were writing about uh, the match and how Galway did poorly and all that, they said then at one stage Patty and Dunman appeared on the scene wearing a faded number 24 jersey. And they said, the jersey no more than the man belonged to another decade. <laughs> now, no disrespect to Patty, he did his best to rally us, but uh, it just didn't happen. Galway beat was common in the Connacht final of 76, but lost to Dublin in the semi-final. The county got some reward, however, when the minor team had a big win over Cork in the minor final. Uh, Roscommon won um, 77, 78, 79 and 80, culminating in their um, in the final appearance against Kerry in the uh, All-Ireland final in 1980. But there was a few of those championships that Galway uh, could have won if they had a bit of luck. Uh, 77 was won. I think uh, Roscommon won it um, after a replay. Um, 78, uh, again, uh, Roscommon won that one up in Pier uh, Stadium. Uh, John Dillon was missing and... Uh, um, Roscommon got a few lucky goals that day. We were, they beat us well in 79, all right, and they beat us in the semi-final in, in uh, 1980, but you, uh, the end of the 70s was really Roscommon's turn, and they got four in a row that time. There was a lot of turmoil at the time, because I remember uh, the first match of that campaign, we went, as far as I can remember, we went to play Monaghan, and uh, there was a strike on at the time, a player's strike at the time, because, uh, as far as I can remember, Liam O'Neill um, was in charge, and then, uh, Liam wanted his own selectors or whatever and the county board didn't want that and, and Liam fell out with them and then um, we decided we wanted Liam O'Neill so uh, eventually they came up with uh, Manny McDonough, Bertie Coleman, uh, Frank Stockwell and you know I mean that was a great team to put together as well but as far as I remember the Lord of Mercy on Tulldown he brought one team to he brought the second team to Monaghan and the first team then decided on Saturday night that they were going so we went up there and drew that match but from there on we, we had a great season that year you know and, and uh, it, was, it was actually great to win a National League.
At that time as well, uh, at Balance Law, St. Grellens had, had really uh, come strong. We won uh, county championships in uh, 79 and 80, and I was um, lucky enough as a result to captain Galway, ironically, in my first championship game. Knocked on by Peter Lee. To midfielder Willie Joyce, and Willie is streaking away. He's now only 45 metres out. And he's got the kick. Has he got the first score? He has from Willie Joyce. Okay, Mike Mann is here for Galway. This is Tommy Nocton. He was nicely out to that, had it well covered. And he's got a beautiful point. John O'Carr leaping well for it. Knocked, blocked by Brian Talsey. Barry Brennan, number 10. The other number 10 is Eamon McManus. This is Stephen Joyce. Jerry Connellan is number 5. Stephen Joyce gets away with it. Harry Keegan, number 2. Still Stephen Joyce. And the point from Stephen Joyce. This is Michal Finner. Meant for John O'Gar, but it was cut off by Peter Lee. And he gives it to Willie Joyce. And Willie's already scored one from a solo like this. This time he leaves it behind. But Barry Brennan is alert. And he's covering up. He got it, but he's in trouble now. It's cleared away by Tony McManus. Brian Talty then to his midfield partner, Willie Joyce. Joyce to Stephen Joyce, his namesake. Still Stephen Joyce. He's got the point. It's five to no score. So Gay McManus with the free, just outside the 45 metre line. About 47 metres out, about 20 metres in from the far sideline, as you can see. And the wind against it. Barry Keegan. Is it Barry Brennan? That's another point. So can Galway hold on to that lead now to win the National League? This is their first appearance since 1967 in the final. The last time they won the league was 1965. That was their third title. Ross Common's only title was won here two years ago. This is Gay McManus. He gets away from Harry Keegan and again from Jerry Connell. And a beautiful goal. What a beautiful goal. A goal and a point in the first two minutes of this second half from Gay McManus here. Danny Murray, Tom Donlan finds him here on the right wing. 20 is Martin Dolphin. This is Porig Morn intercepting, then it's taken away from him. Tony McManus, six is Peter Lee, this is Dermot Early. They shot a goal! Oh, it was Tony McManus who got the ball away from Porig Morn. This is Seamus McHugh, it's all over. Galway are the new National League champions. So there are the Galway people so pleased. Look at Frank Stockwell and Matty McDonough, both of them who won National Leagues here. Frank Stockwell in 57. Matty had a, he had a great ability to gel people together. He's a very affable person and uh, everybody got on well with him and he brought a great spirit into the team and uh, things gelled for us and we went right through that league uh, without dropping any uh, game at all beat Kerry in the semi-final and then I suppose to show that Galway were coming back again as a force in Connacht we played the league final in 81 against Roscommon up in Croke Park and uh, we won the game rather easily in the end but it was, uh, it was the end of Roscommon's dominance in Connacht and the start of our dominance again for a number of years. A quarter grail galair, Tomajig Fanacht, Erfana Blinta, Kun Kurn, Nashunta, Kororashi Nalyev, Anish, Hoshi Adam! So things were starting to look really rosy, but like lots of favourites, uh, you know, the old championship beckons and um, uh, we, we went down to Mayo uh, in Castle Bar. We really went down to a fellow called Willie Nally, who for the first uh, 35, uh, 30 or 35 minutes, he just caught everything in midfield. I don't know where he went afterwards, but he did enough damage that day. 82, 83 and 84, then we put three kind of titles in a row together with the, basically the same team. The new players that had come in told, um, Gay Mack had come in in the um, 77, but Tomás Tierney, Brian O'Donnell, um, other players like that came in, uh, Pori Coyne came in um, from the minor teams of the late 70s and um, the Galway had a good under 21 team as well in 1980. I think Cork beat them, Cork won the All-Ireland final. 
but um, we got a number of players out of that that uh, proved very beneficial to us during the 80s. And very nice passing movement there as coming down for the ball there. to Jerry Carroll who's coming up in one of his solos. Ball deflected into the centre there by Stephen Keneavy. Getting it down to Moss Tierney. Oh, a lovely bit of feeling there by Richie Lee. Richie's kick is high and Richie's kick is good. This is Gay McManus and coming to help him there on the far side and going up the field with Barry Brennan. Barry Brennan up now to Tom Nocton. Nocton in front of the goal. It's a goal! It's a goal for Galway! Tom Nocton, the scorer, a passing movement that had everything. Here it is again, the pass by Barry Brennan goes up to Tom Nocton. Nocton takes a shot and the score is Galway 1-4. Offley, three points and about 13 minutes gone. Back now to Brian Chalty. Chalty, a nice high ball and it's gone over the bar. A lovely point by Brian Chalty and the Galway men picking off the scores from out the field as they've done so often. Johnny Mooney coming down for it. Cross into the centre now, and this is Brendan Lowry. Goal! Goal by Brendan Lowry. And here come Galway again now. Gay McManus trying to find somewhere to get rid of it. Oh, misjudgments there by Offaly defence. Val Daly taking every advantage. Back now to Willie Joyce. Brian Talty, across now, where Pat O'Neill has it, Pat going through, a shot for the half-back, the point for the half-back. Switches all round the place here now. Offley 111, Galway 110, Offley in the attack again, Richie Connor. It's high and it's over the bar for a point, Richie from out on the far sideline, Sending that one over. Richie Connor, whom I knew well from uh, being in training college with him, and uh, always played at centre back, played centre forward that day. And as I've often told him since, he kicked a marvellous point from out near the Cusick stand, which I'd lay any money he'd never any money that he'd never do again. But he did it, and uh, awfully went on to win the match. We had a very good forward line. You know what I mean? When you look at the McManus and the Brennans and the Stephen Joyce's, they were uh, top class footballers. And uh, then defensively, like when you look at the Johnny Hughes's and, uh, you know, Tommy Joe, I'm not too sure whether they knew Tommy Joe was a defender or an attacker at the time, but I think Tommy Joe was at full four and he was a huge, I mean, he was a huge man and he was a great target man. And uh, it was a very good Galway team. And uh, it was unfortunately, you know, against Offaly, we, we should really have taken that game. I think after uh, Offaly's victory in 82, we really felt that um, 83 was going to be our year that, uh, we knew we were good enough. We'd won the league in 81. The All-Ireland Champions uh, of 82 had beaten us narrowly in the semi-final. Uh, we won through Connacht again that year. Beat Donegal in the semi-final even though we didn't play well. And then played Dublin in that infamous final of 83. This is something that I haven't spoken much about <laughs> and didn't ever look at it or anything. But to me, it, in, in fairness, it, it was one of the, my greatest disappointments. And uh, this is a side that early in the year nobody gave a thought to as potential All-Ireland champions. Well, here they are in the final. These are the men from Galway with that special crest on their, uh, their tracksuits. This crest to commemorate the fact that the 500th anniversary of Galway is coming up next year. Coming to that, into that semi-final, in uh, the All-Ireland semi-final against Donegal, I got this twinge in the in the in the in the, in, in the grind, you know. So I played on anyhow and didn't take much notice. And on the next morning, couldn't get out of bed, you know. And uh, actually, didn't train between that and the semi-final. Told plenty of lies to Matty and all the boys and to all the media that I was fine. But I had actually torn the tendon away from the bone, you know. We were walking down to mass, and I remember stepping off the the curb and. The foot was just like as if you put a knife in there. I could feel something pulling. So I came back from Mass and I lied in the bed and I said to myself, Johnny, don't attempt to go out in Crow Park today because, I mean, you're just not able to, 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 to do the business. I remember instead of being able to turn and twist, I used to have to kind of go around in a semicircle. But then I said, on the other hand, this is one all Ireland we're going to win and you're playing for 13 or 14 years. Don't miss it. Stephen Keneby there, big full back to take it. 
kicking it against a very strong breeze. Oh dear, look at the way the wind caught that one. Barry Brennan in possession. Been bottled up here, still with the ball. Well, he certainly did, made a good run up the wing with it. The ball, half knocked down, goes into the centre when Van Daly gets it. In now to Brian Talty. Talty tries to sell a dummy to John Caffrey. Caffrey is tackled with the shoulder there. Back to Gay McManus, his kick locked down. Brian Talty snapping it up. A nice, lobbing, dangerous kind of ball. Mick Holden traps it down. Doesn't take any risks with it, with the breeze the way it is. Way down the field. And Tomas Tierney is playing a third centre field for Galway. And uh, John Caffrey is playing a third centre field for uh, the Dublin players. So there are plenty of open spaces around there. They free to be taken. Well, the referee putting it back to where it should be taken, and that's on the 45-metre line, and Brian Talty is to take it. Brian, a short one, into Val Daly. Val trying to shake off Tommy Drum. Into the centre to game, McManus. McManus trying to work his way through his shot, and the first step of the game! A point by Dave McManus against the Greens. And this is Pierre Pat Canavan. Pat Canavan out the far side to Antonio too. Antonio too across the goal mouth. Barney Rock is in there. And so also in there is Seamus McHugh, and this is getting to be a little bit hectic. Seamus McHugh has gone down, also gone down there is Joe McNally. And the referee telling him to get up. And uh, here's a replay of what happened, and down goes the Galway man, and uh, oh, and Joe McNally. Well, Joe McNally being attended to as the game goes on. Barry Rock takes his jump. It's a goal! It's a goal for Dublin! It came from a free that we had won about our own 21-yard line. Uh, Porry Coyne came out to take the free, and Heffo came in to tend to Joe McNally. At the time, there was great controversy about um, um, management encroaching onto the field of play. So Porrick took the kick out, and I, in some way or another, I think he got involved with Hefo verbally. Um, the ball went out over my head, and Barney Rock ca caught it outside the 50-yard line. Uh, Barney makes out that he saw um, Porrick Hine off his goal line and lobbed it in. At the time, I thought it was a harmless kick that was going nowhere, but when I turned around, I saw Porrick scrambling to get back on the goal line, the ball hopping inside him and winding up in the net. Caught there by Richie Lee, up to Brian O'Donnell. Brian O'Donnell into Val Daly. Val now right through the far side of Gay McManus, going racing out after him. Jimmy Hargan after him. Gay McManus has got there, he's coming in through the centre now. There's nobody in front of him but John O'Leary and the goal posts. And the ball is still in play. It went off his boot, I don't know how it curled out. But it didn't go over the bar, maybe the wind, I don't know what happened, but it came right out. That was a most amazing thing. It looked as if it was going in towards the goal, and it wound up about 10 metres out from the goal, out near the sideline, and I don't think anybody touched it. Barry Brennan is to take this free for Galway on the 13-metre line. It's about 20 metres to the right of the goal on our right. He kicks it and it's over the bar. Typical Barry Brennan accuracy. Barry, who was off in the semi-final with an Achilles tendon trouble, is back in for the final and making his presence felt. And not only is it raining and blowing, but it's getting kind of dark at the moment. But perhaps the sun will be back before long. Brian Mullen's got his fist to that. Brian tells me that I, I, I pulled out of him, but I often say, like, at my, with the size I was, I wasn't going to pull out of a big man like him. But uh, and he just he let back the elbow, and, and you know th that happens in a game, you know. But uh, it was unfortunate. It was unfortunate for for Galway, and it was unfortunate for Brian. It was unfortunate for me as well that the thing happened because it spoiled the All Ireland for both of us, I suppose, you know. But more so for Galway because uh, you know I, I feel if we had 15 against 15 again, that we would have a better chance than the way it went. Like people. I mean, I live in Dublin and people still slag you about the fact that, uh, you know, you had two extra men and, and they weren't used. And 
uh, I, I feel if, if uh, actually if we had prepared for, for uh, if we had a better style of football in fact um, we might have come on and, and, and won that game but they have completely mystifies the Dubliners. Ball comes down to Tomas Tierney and Tomas, there is a right rugby up down here in front of us and I don't know what the referee is going to do if he is going to speak to the linesman before he decides what he's going to do. And the referee is talking to Tomas Tierney and also to Ray Hazley. Wait now, wait now. The referee has sent the two of them off. Galway have now put Michael Brennan as a kind of a top of the right and a right half forward. And Barry Brennan is a kind of a centre field. I'm using this kind of because with players put off, there's a lot of gaps to be filled. John Caffrey penalised. And now it looks as if somebody else is going on. Apparently flattened somebody over there on the far, and he's been cut off. It's 12 Dublin and uh, 14 Galway. Ball at the centre of the field. Tommy Brown. You would have to admire the Dublin guys that were on the field for the uh, the last 20 minutes of that game. There was 12 of them, and they really played their heart out. Um, some of them gave the performance of their lives. Um, some of them um, didn't feature in a championship again, and yet played super football that day. You can't devise tactics for being down two men, really. I'm playing against a huge wind. You know, you just had it. Looking back on the film of that, one gasps when one sees it, Galway forward in, on his own, uh, near goal, and, you know, ball in his hands. But you get days when you kick ways, you know, and you cannot account for it. Here comes Barney now, his kick, it's in, and it's over the bar. Just, it looked innocent as it went in. It could have been a mortler. Instead, it was a venal. 11 to 4 in favour of Dublin. And this is a Brian O'Donnell. He's going right through. He sends it across. It's a goal. It's a goal. Yes, it's a goal. It's a goal. Stephen Joyce got it. Stephen Joyce has finished it into the net. And here it is. Coming out now. In 76, maybe not so bad because it was my first. I was 19. I felt that I had a lot of years, which, as it turned out, I did have. But as they all stepped by, they were all hard. But definitely the lowest point was the final of 83. It was another bad, bad year at the hands of Dublin for Galway. You know, that was unfortunately the last time Johnny donned the, the jersey. It actually took me 
a good two and a half years, three years to recover from that. And I do look back now at times and, you know, I see all these guys that have All-Ireland medals and pockets of All-Ireland medals and, you know, the ones or two. And it saddens me at times, but then again that I look at it and say, hey, I've had great innings, you know, I, I was one of the lucky ones that probably got the chance to play in All-Irelands and, you know, uh, won a couple of All-Stars and, you know, won county championships and that type of thing. But at the end of the day, I'd trade it all for that one medal. My memories of it are not good, obviously. We were beaten when perhaps, or more than likely, we should have won the game. We didn't play well. The conditions were atrocious, if I can recall correctly. Nothing went right, and uh, there's not much more to be said. We don't think, I don't talk about it much, really, now, because there are no good memories from it. So, that's it. They, we didn't deserve to win it the way we played. I think every player who ever played has some match that he doesn't want to think about. You know, every player, whether it's Dublin or Galway or Kerry or wherever he comes from, I think every player has that match in him that he, he doesn't want to think of when he lays down at night. And it's the one that will come to him more often than any others. And I think, unfortunately, Galway's experience in 83 is probably one of those matches for a lot of fellas. You know, and it's just one of... It's like the recent match, Kerry and me, like the Kerry fellas w won't ever want to think or talk about that match. But there's no explaining it. It's just something that happens on the day and that's it. Galway were near on a number of occasions. But to be honest about it, looking back, they, they lacked a few class footballers. They had people who could take on the mantle of leadership, but they didn't. I don't want to mention any names. I'll let you figure them out yourself. But, like, in a team, really, whereas you want a few really good driving forces in the team, the fellas that are phonetically interested, and they'll pull along other guys as well. Now, Galway were close on a number of occasions, but I'd say the way that our team kind of uh, were handled at the end didn't help things either. People knew about it. And that didn't help. But, like, uh, we had some terrible bad days in Crow Park. One of the worst was where the 12, we were beaten by the 12 apostles uh, we were two extra men. I'm going to say I, I left Crow Park that day, and honest to goodness, tonight, I don't think I ever felt as bad in all my life. Did you know. you despair for the future of Galway football at that point? Well, I remember I was driving home from the match within the column. And there was silence for a long time. And I remember Colin saying to me, Jesus, Pat, this must be the worst day ever. And I said, well, right. I never saw anything like it, I'll tell you the truth. That was my last game. I was a sub on that particular day in 83. Again, it was a game I felt we should have won, you know, um, but should have, win should have and not winning it. It's it's a big, huge difference, you know. So that was it. I, I decided at that time I had enough and, um, you know, retired from the game. And we won two Connacht finals in 86 and 87. Um, I suppose, in a way, we were fortunate to win uh, 86 because for 67 minutes of that Connacht final, it looked like Ross Common were going to win it. Uh, I can't remember the score, but all I know is that it was uh, very, very low. But Stephen came on anyway, and within seconds, he, he had the ball in the back of the net and um, that was a great occasion because Roscommon were defending vigorously with three or four backs and of course Gay Sheeran. Manny Coleman. Mickey Brennan inside to Brino. Inside to Dandy Kenny. To Stephen Joyce. Galway lost the All-Ireland semi-final to Tyrone, but once again, a good minor team, including players such as Kevin Walsh and Tomás Mannion, compensated by beating Cork in the final. After the 86 semi-final, Billy Joyce came in as manager, and uh, it was uh, basically the same team. We won the Connacht final, we beat Mayo in Castlebar in the Connacht final. Mayo um, had a good team that year, and they, 
they expected, I think, to um, to uh, take Connacht, but uh, we beat them rather surprisingly for them, but not for us in the Connacht final. And we played Cork in the semi final, and um, we felt in uh, going into the semi final that year that um, that it might have been our year because Cork had won in Munster and Meath had won in. Leinster. We felt that uh, if we got by Cork that we had a great chance of beating Meath in the final. And there it is, the game is underway, a game in which Cork have been installed as popular favourites. Where Galway bring an awful lot of experience with them to Croke Park. And here's John Joyce trying to steal inside Tony Nation's defence. Scoring opportunity and Galway are in front after 15 seconds. John Fallon, has he got the pace? Good solo run by Cleary. Linking up with Hayes, the shot, oh it's a goal! It caught a deflection, it's a goal for Cork. Paddy Hayes' opening score of this year's championship. He puts Cork into the lead for the first time in the game. Brian O'Donnell, Galway needing a couple of scores to give them a little bit of hope for the second half. Gay McManus, or Val Daly rather. Daly rifling, oh it's a brilliant shot! That's precisely what they needed. Val Daly, watch this, for a bit of intuitive skill from Val Daly with the left boot, rifles it away up into the top corner, there was simply no stopping it. Tony Davis is the man who's putting in the tackle, here's Brennan. Galway forwards inclined to wait rather than move when the forward is in position, but it's Brennan who picks it up beautifully on the return, that's one of the nicest points of the match so far. Miss Talty, nice turn. Christy Ryan has come out the field as he did in the Munster final. John Joyce, Galway now, putting on the pressure. Cork having to absorb. Valdeli, and once again there's just a point in it. Valdeli the captain to Jerry Burke. Towards Valdeli. One player to aim at inside if he decides to play it in, if he can. The forwards regroup now. Here's Gay McManus. Punting it, looking for the equalising score. The sides are level. It's a very courageous fight back by Galway. Cork have certainly fallen to pieces in the second half. Galway have really carried the fight to them. Behind by four points at one stage, they never gave up. And now they're in an attacking position with Jerry Burke. 13 metres out, three minutes to go. Sides level. The next score or two will surely decide it. Here's John Fallon, the right corner back, way up there with the forwards. Will he get the lead score? He does! John Fallon, the former St. Charlotte's fan, the fans ready to invade the pitch. Play continues, it's a brilliant catch by John O'Driscoll. Held up about 46 We were a point up against Cork, I think, when going into injury time, but Larry Thompkins kicked a marvellous free from him, about 55 yards out under the Hogan stand. Here he comes, his side a point behind. He's given it everything. Is it right? It is! and it went to a replay. Sadly for us, uh, Cork won the uh, replay rather uh, easily. Here's Jerry Burke, started the second half, and full forward, and was playing on the half forward line. Corey Kelly, is still attending to Gay McManus, going down to 14 players for the moment is Gay McManus, uh, Cork plays it in seven, Stephen Joyce for Barry Brennan, third time lucky, maybe yes! It's no more than he deserved. Backed up nicely, and again loose marking, and Val Daly of course scored a goal from almost the same position. Billy organised that we train in Dublin, and it certainly revitalised my interest in the whole thing. Paddy Mulligan took over as um, training manager in Dublin, and we did some, to me, much more modern training. Brian Talty for his sins and, and, and Barry Brennan um, suggested to Billy Joyce in 87 that maybe I should take the, the Dublin-based Galway players uh, for training and so on and uh, Brian Barry Brennan, Gay Mack and Michael Summers from Montpellier, a, a sub-goalkeeper. So that we, we, we got together out in uh, the Bank of Ireland grounds in Clansky and, and Finian O'Shea, who, who was uh, one of the people involved in Bank of Ireland, uh, kindly got us the ground there and, and got a few lads as well. So we, we got around 12 or 13 lads uh, to help us train with these, with Talty and, and, and uh, Barry Brennan and Gay Mack. And uh, it was very, very enjoyable for the two years, 87 and 88. We uh, won the Colin final, 87 beat Mayo. And then, unfortunately, got beaten by Cork in a replay in the semi-final. Larry Tompkins, the uh, the Terminator, ended up getting the equaliser that day. But um, 
it was a pity because we, we would have met Meath in the final, but Cork went on to meet Meath and, and that was it and from our point of view. But I certainly enjoyed it. My, my two years with, with Brian Talty, smashing lads and, and Billy Joyce was a superb man to be working with, really good. It was played on the Sunday before Christmas. I don't know why, maybe the game had been called off earlier, but um, Christmas was at the end of that week. And as I said, there was an inch of snow on the ground and conditions under that were very mucky. Pat Spillane was sent in on Mike Judge that day. And you could have picked better spots on a day like that than in on Mike. But um, time and time again, balls came in and Mike came out with the ball. Pat was making out that Mike wasn't winning the ball fairly, but the referee wasn't seeing it that way. Eventually, with a few minutes to go, and we, we were leading, a ball went in. Again, as Michal here would say, there was a shamazzle between Mike and Pat. Mike got the ball, Pat finished up on the ground, and Mike won a free out. Pat at this stage, he was at 10 on the Richter scale and he got up, started complaining to the ref, moaning to the ref and even shouting out at him. Mike went back in to take the free and the free was to be taken from the spot where Pat was. So Pat, or Mike gently moved Pat aside and turned around to him and told him that if he didn't start, stop complaining, Santa wouldn't come to him. <laughs> During the next eight years, Galway appeared in only one Connick final in 1990, in which they were beaten by Roscommon. The Miners did win five Connacht titles in this period, but only reached one All-Ireland final in 1994, when they were well beaten by Kerry. However, the team contained a number of players who, earlier in the year, had starred in St. Jarrett's Hogan Cup win over St. Patrick's Mara. Well, to get Michael, it's all time to live this shit. I got Sora Hishdig, and son, I get Forrick Joyce. Forrick, I get a clean end of the hand, and at the end of a knee step, the Pulitzer, Forrick Joyce, and the other boy get. I got Scurleen, and Forrick Joyce. I got Zinish, knee on a rock on him. It's particularly notable that St. Gerald's won a Hogan Cup in every decade. I think that too is a wonderful record. It was a particularly brilliant team in the early 60s. The current president of uh, St. Gerald's, as we speak, Father Oliver Hughes, was himself a player then. But that team uh, produced a brilliant Galway minor team. And you had Enda Colloran here, you had Seamus Layden, you had a brilliant footballer from Milton called Tony Ryan, you had a brilliant tune footballer, Jerry Prendergast, and, uh, you know, several others. Uh, and that team that won the two in a row, uh, in, to, to again to a large extent, led to the three in a row that Galway won. The great period in Galway football. Tradition plays a part in it. Tradition in the sense that uh, all of us involved in games, the whole school community, know that very high standards are expected of us in the area of Gaelic football because it's our chosen uh, number one sport. Uh, tradition helps young lads who come in here to want to achieve at the highest levels and to be prepared to put in whatever effort and discipline is required to do that. I think it also helps to realise that most things in Gaelic football can be taught and we are a teaching outfit. Now there are individual flares and uh, skills that the likes of Michael Donlan has and that Porrick Joyce has and uh, Declan Meehan that nobody can teach, they're personal. But uh, that there are an awful lot of things like uh, how to get a ball in Gilly football, just how to get the ball, how to fetch a ball over your head, how to catch it in your chest, how to pick it off the ground, how to stop an opponent, block the ball down, take it off. In other words, how to get the ball for your team. Now the 94 team would rate very high in the great Gerlis teams. And Tommy and Porrick Joyce uh, Declan and uh, Tomás Meehan, uh, Michael Donlan, uh, John Divley, they were all on that team. Now, uh, the day of the Hogan Cup final when Gerrard's gave an exhibition against a fine Maharad team, the two outstanding performances that day were given by Declan Meehan and by Michael Donlan. So it's interesting that these guys were special then, just as they are now.